Okay, so th thank you for a really interesting talk. So uh, Daniel introduced this idea that uh, brain areas in the default uh, node network are on the highest level of hierarchy and they are connected just because the levels, the areas on the, higher, uh, on the highest level need to communicate with, with each other. But how do these areas actually, during development, know that they need to connect uh, with each other? Well, development uh, is in your wheelhouse, I think, today, so it would actually it would make a lot of sense. They, they don't have to know that. Um, they just happen to be in the, in the right place in the right time uh, when they develop. And so the natural thing is to look for the, for the next buddies to arrive and to just make friends with each other. But they are far away in space. Well, they're in the adult brain. Mm -hmm. But in development, they're, they're very close together. And so the, the, the high, the, what, what you call the higher order areas, so areas that are of, of, of low neuronal density and of relatively low architectonic differentiation in terms of their laminar structure, they tend to develop early on, or at least they finish early in their development. And so these are the first bodies to arrive. So one of the explanations also for why they, they have so many connections in the adult brain may be that they're just the, the, the first arrivals to the party. And so they're in a very good position to form many, many links with all the other guys. So using data on birth dates and C. elegans, for instance, Markus Kaiser and, and colleagues have demonstrated that this directly, birth date directly relates to the number of connections that a neuron in C. elegans picks up. And similar processes may help to explain the degree of connectivity in the adult brain. Uh, but in, the, in terms of um, being here in the room, I mean, if you went to the right party, right place, right time, you form the right connections. And these are the first ones to arrive, and so they can form very dense interconnections early on. And then, of course, what you see in the adult brain is not exactly what you have in the developing brain, but something that you know, goes through several processes of pruning and size expansion and modification, and, of course, very specific mechanisms of, of, of cell-to-cell targeting, signaling, and, of course, to, to experience-based plasticity and, 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 and postnatal plasticity processes. So it's a, it's a somewhat modified and, and different picture in the, in the adult, but this is maybe uh, a basic developmental setup that helps to explain a certain scaffold of connectivity that you can still recognize in the adult brain. Okay, so thank you. That's a fascinating answer. But these areas are evolutionarily newer, but you are saying that in the development they uh, originally are any, these higher level areas? I, I know relatively little about evolution, um, and I'm not sure what was there earlier on okay. or later. I, I think there are various hypotheses on, on which areas are more, uh, more fundamental evolutionary or not. I, at least developmentally, they develop quite early. If you had asked that same question 30 years ago, people would have said it's very straightforward. Everything projects to everything and then pruning comes and magically you end up with adult patterns of connectivity. I don't believe that for a moment. I think that's ridiculous. One of the reasons why I believe that these long-distance weak connections, which are going to be linking associational areas, are highly significant is because exactly for the reason you pointed out, the challenge for the formation of these long-distance connections during development is huge. I think there is pathway selection, I think there's directed growth, and I think these are the factors which are going to come into it. The point is that when we look at these very, very weak, very long-distance connections, they're highly systematically statistically speaking, representative. That's to say they are consistent across individuals. They don't look like anything to do with noise. Oh, I mean, uh, I don't want to deroute the, uh, the, that line of questions, so if there's more on that, because my question is very different, so uh, if there's more comments first on, the, uh, on that. Okay, so, okay, I'll the roots then. <laughs> um, yeah, I was I was wondering in the uh, in the various talks uh, 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 how much of the uh, uh, non-interoperability aspect of the various platforms was a problem, of how much of the uh, uh, the uh, some of the mapping of uh, terminology uh, between you know what, because you're 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 spanning such a large uh, and and you know vari variable space. Um, no, what, what, what was the uh, the hurdles and the and the difficulties in terms of like uh, uh, recognizing those uh, those principles and and where where are these more like uh, informatics problems coming in in in, in those uh, in those research? Um, so I guess I'm gonna take this one. I I can tell you what what we were trying to do with the with the marmoset uh, 
connectivity atlas because this is you know, sort of the, the the newest guide to the party and uh, you know the first that the first thing that that you that you, that we did is to look around and see you know if we want to be because of course we would like to be interoperable and 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 provide the data that have be used by many for different purposes is to just go and look around what what's on the market in what form it is it is available and uh, how you can cater to this and then you have to just um, design whatever you are doing so so it so it uh, so it works this way and there are obviously unnecessary trade-offs right so so um, you were yesterday on the on the meeting and there was a question why we used uh, retrograde connectivity and supposedly entire grade could be or should be better. Well, the problem is that if you want to if you want to be compatible, you probably would like to use compatible methods or the method that could the methods that could be quantified and compared with with results of, of other studies. You have to employ the the, the the definitions of the quantities that that others employed, and. Um, and uh, and and you know and, and stick to it, um, especially when it when it comes to to, to areas and homologs. Um, I think we address this in a, in a in a clever way. So as I was I was as I was trying to show, except for allowing for uh, this parcellation based analysis, we were like, okay, let's let's drop the concept of areas altogether and just. Uh, let's let's express it in a purely geometric geometric way. So that that's why that's why it's, uh, I think it's very important that we that we provide a stochastic location of every every labeled cell. Therefore, you can take any any of the parcellation of the marble uh, cortex that you, that you would like to draw and impose it on these uh, uh, on the on the results and have your um, connectivity results uh, piped through. Any parcellation you can, you can uh, you, any parcellation you wish. Um. Uh, yes. Uh, good morning. So thank you very much for the talks. Um, it was interesting to learn since I'm a little outside of the area. But my question is addressed to Professor Kennedy to expand on the comment you made in the beginning about the mouse. Um, knowing a lot about the mouse is not going to help us about the human, uh, but presumably the principles that are coming out will lead there. So I was just, I guess, a little confused by the comment. So, you know, yeah, so if you could expand. Thank you. Yeah, well, a provocative comment, perhaps, yes. Um, the experiments that we can do in the mouse are much more sophisticated, and so we can test ideas. Uh, there's a recent study I saw um, showing that uh, long-distance connections, specifically targeting s groups of cells which have a close lineage, that's going to massively increase the clustering at the single cell level. Now, I don't know how you would do this in the macaque. I don't know how you would do that experiment. I don't think the technology exists to be able to ask the question if the connection of the projection from a long distance going from area A to area B is specifically targeting a group of cells which have a close lineage in that way. Now, the consequences of that in the mouse are very, very, very fundamental. They're going to completely change how we think about how individual cells communicate across the cortex. So we have to battle and, and try and um, and try and answer that question, is the macaque different in that respect? I think anybody working on macaque actually has an ethical obligation because if you can do it in the mouse and if it gives you the same result, then you do it in the mouse and you get the same result. And if it's, if it's different, then you need to know about it. I think that we have as a community to work in parallel on the mouse and the macaque. And I think that the tools will improve. There's transgenesis in, in producing macaque models. Uh, Mu Ming Pu is pushing for this in, in Shanghai, and that's going, to, that's going to be an important factor. There's a, the work in Marmoset, which is very, very exciting, and there's definitely going to be... And people like Pascal Fries is using optogenetics very successfully now in Marmoset. So I think there's light at the end of the tunnel, but I think that the... I think that at the end of the day, the other point I wanted to make is there's not going to be a single model. The work of uh, Frank uh, Pollu and Cécile Charrier looking at this uh, gene which is expressed in the, in the spines and showing that they, they exist in humans and this neotenic property of the, of the spine in humans is going to be very different from any other, macaque, any other primate. 
So uh, there's not going to be a single model. I think we have to triangulate. I think we have to work on different non-human primate models. If you're interested in socialization, the marmoset is a, is, is a prime choice. If you're, if you're interested in... in um, uh, so th that was the meaning of what I wanted to say. I think mouse work is, should be... I think there should be a much tighter interaction between work done in the mouse and the macaque. Does that answer you? More or less? What about the less then? I'll, I'll, I'll re repeat the question briefly. Is the terminology we use sufficient for, uh, f for what we do? Or should we also discuss to have a more precise terminology to better reflect the methods that are used? Just a short comment, and I think we need to continue discussions outside this session. Maybe let's go down the line. I would just say yes. Uh, I think we would need better terminology. Uh, just a connect term sounds sexy, but it's not capturing uh, all the implications of what we want to do. And if you want to have uh, precise, precisely defined interpretations and precisely defined focus on what you're doing, you need to precisely define your terms. I definitely agree with that. It you know, in practice, it's a matter of uh, having a mental shortcut. You know, during a very time-constrained presentation, you use the term connectum, and the context is supposed to uh, point to the to the details. Um, but yes, I, I agree that you know, the more, more precise we are, uh, the better in this context. Yes, I think there's a big problem with vocabulary. I mean, functional connectivity which I think is going to be the route into understanding human cortex and its relationship and the understanding of what we understand by macaque and taking it forward. But it's a terrible terminology. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing functional about it and there's no connection. <laughs> but, but it's used in a way that might, uh, you know, in a big audience, not everybody's up to date on what exactly you're talking about and people going away thinking, oh, he's talking about functions and connections and he's not. He's talking about you know, uh, something quite, quite distinct. So I think that there is a problem there. I think the word connectome is not bad at all. It's the idea that you really want to work with a square matrix. So uh, in the good old days, you would stick an inject, uh, and you'd inject one area, and you'd say, oh, it's got this and that, and you'd work in a sort of plan about how this was all functioning on the back of an envelope, but you wouldn't be knowing about the full connectivity of a subset of areas. I think connectome is correct. Uh, just to keep this <coughs> to keep this fun, I'm going to go ahead and say that no, no, I think there there is good in uh, in having some of the mix of terminologies. I agree with you, know, but the the value of having these terminologies that overlap inappropriately at times is that we find a way to be able to talk to each other. And even though there might be almost strategic misunderstandings that are taking place, it allows us to cross uh, to step out of our our disciplines that we're comfortable in and to believe that we're at least sharing in a similar dialogue to extend beyond our, our, um, our domain limits. So there's also value to that. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have had a lot of food for thought. There will be an important message about others means of sustaining ourselves. But first, let us give a big applause for the participants here who have given us a very exciting session on connectivity.